Eva Hendje and uh, I'm from Sweden. Uh, I live in Stockholm and very far up north of Sweden. And I'm, uh, I would label myself as a mental health activist. Uh, and I'm a child and adolescent psychiatrist and also associate professor at Umeå University uh, doing research on the adolescent brain and on um, these kinds of so-called disorders that are related to overwhelming stress like depression, anxiety. In my world this pandemic of, of depression and increasing suicide rates among young people globally is almost like an expected outcome of the global economy and the fragmentation uh, that we're experiencing. Uh, and there is also difficult, I think, for, for many of us to make meaning of our lives. Uh, we, we have lost the cohesion in the communities and we have lost connection to life itself. And living a life like that is, is um, in combination with uh, geopolitical unrest and, and, and war close by and and the climate threats and all of it, it's like, what's the point? And, and I think uh, within psychiatry and within mental health, there's been um, an eff uh, almost like an effort to isolate this problem from the meta-crisis and almost kind of put the blame back on the individual and say, you know, what's wrong with you? And, and, uh, and then how can we fix you? Uh, so that's my job as a mental health professional and often that ends up with um, medication, some kind of SSRIs, antidepressant medication or something like that, which has very little proof of efficacy in young people. And uh, I think we are really, you know, we're really, in, it's, it's almost like a crime because I think instead we should ask, you know, what, what happened to you and what, what is your story? Uh, what, how, how are you perceiving the world and together how, c how can we look at what's, what's too difficult to, to bear on one's own? How can we together bring those things up? And, and uh, yeah, so I think it's, it's very much linked but there is, there is uh, lots of um, tendencies of trying to isolate it as, a, as an independent pandemic that is unrelated to, to the big meta-crisis and the late-stage capitalism and neoliberal value systems. Sometimes I can, I can almost feel there is a, a deliberate way of disempowering the young people who can actually be on the barricades and actually be empowered to create change. And, and what, one is to, to distract, uh, one is to disempower by disconnect, uh, and that I think is happening a lot through the ways the education system is quite competitive, the way social media is uh, also promoting a false identity. We, there are lots of, of ways to split among people that way and I think that's very, very unfortunate. Um, another way of looking at it is from like core biology, like our human conditions and the way, the way we are wired. Um, because, and I, 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 that applies for all mammals, not just us humans. But when, when we are exposed to overwhelming stress or, or, or more of a mild stressor, um, we start to hyperactivate. So we get into flight and fight modes and we get a lot of adrenaline and it takes a lot of energy for the system to uphold that level of arousal. And sooner or later, if the stressor is still there or the threat from, from the overpowering <laughs> situation that you're in, then you'll reach the point of overwhelm. And then it's part of the, the autonomic nervous systems that call the dorsal vagal system that will shut, shut down. So instead the person gets into an in immobilized state where you can't do much. You still have a, a lot of anxiety but you can't move, you can't act, you're kind of entrapped in your own body. And if the stressor is even more life-threatening or the threat is, is even more overwhelming, then, then you'll go into complete collapse and go into a dissociative state. And from there you can't act. You can't tell yourself to, to activate because that is, you, you are in, in, in a very lonely and very calm place, a numbed out space. And I think huge parts of our global population today are living the lives from that place. And, 
Um, I think that's, that's basically why I'm here, because I want to, to give hope and say there are ways to get out of that. And the way out, you will have to feel a lot of things that you have previously shut away. And that's often more overwhelming to feel on your own. So that's why we need to go small and stay connected in, in small groups to address these things. And I think this ideally should be done outside of the mental health care system. I've been operating within it to try to help depressed youth that way. But I think ultimately, you know, we can create models and that would I, that's what I've been working with that we can implement also in the communities worldwide to educate about this, this mechanism and empower people to, to, yeah, to get out of the freeze and flop states and be back on track with themselves. Some of the techniques to take you out of here will be applied as almost like a bypass. So, um, you know, to, to, if you use mindfulness or, or compassion as, a, as an example, if you are in a threatened and vulnerable community, your, your, your life is basically at stake. And somebody comes and said, you know, you need to practice compassion here. <laughs> it's like, no, <laughs> it's not what's needed. There needs to be action to protect and defend life itself also. And, and then, so I think some of these practices have been also uh, kind of um, hijacked by the dominant culture and, and applied as a way to further numb or further distract or further kind of bypass the actual root causes of the problems. So um, the way I've been thinking of it is to, to start by creating a small group and practice self-regulation, to practice using your nervous system from a bottom-up way instead of thinking, I should be calm, I should be calm, that doesn't work. So by using your breath or slow movement or you know, practices like have, have, has been done for millennia in, in, in yoga or in all kinds of cultures, and, and you, you educate around what dissociation is, so you can tap yourself back into your body, you can move your feet, you can be aware of what's going on. So you need also to practice interoceptive awareness to, to be able to enter your body, because that's often what is, what is shut off. Uh, we get disembodied when we dissociate, so, so coming back. And, and this takes, for most people, a few months or at least a few weeks with more or less regular practice in a safe container um, to grasp and, and to actually start to experience that, wow, this is my body, here I am in the present moment, here now. And, and when you have that established, it's, it's time to look at, okay, what, what is your story, what is your narrative, what are the drivers in your environment that have caused you into this position of overwhelm. And you'll hear lots of stories uh, among young people with, with similar root causes. It could be fam domestic violence, it could be uh, bullying at school, social exclusion, loss, grief, fear of the future, these kinds of experiences. And when they are expressed in a, in a container where people are able to self-regulate, then something happens which is quite magic, and that is that I'm not alone other are also suffering from this crisis that we're in and we're experiencing this together so there is an aspect of of common humanity that is usually empowering and and you know when, when that is is up and people are engaged then then um, it's also time to ask the question uh, what am I passionate about in which way can I contribute and what are my deepest values that I want to live accordingly to and then try, try to help activate and, and take these kind of practices and perspectives out in the, in the community in different ways. And I see it as almost like a mandala that, you know, we all have different ways of contributing and it's not one, one model. I think the model that I explained to you now, it's, it's quite generic and it can be applied in almost like a research, uh, action research way um, in all sorts of communities, because it's based in biology, and and then what comes up will be different, and and the action to get get engaged in the world will be different. The needs will be different, and the individuals will be different, and that's the beauty of it, right? Yeah. So I think these kinds of I, I would love to see these kinds of groups <laughs> popping up everywhere, and and. Uh, 
I, I think it's, 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 for me it's beautiful to be part of a movement like this that's outside of the big system. The global economic uh, neoliberal late state capitalism, however you want to name this entity, um, it's, it's, it's being imprinted in us and we're all complicit with it, whether we want it or not. And it's also so much part of, of our everyday lives, so we don't see it, we take it for granted. So it's, it's not only a, an economic or transactional system, but it's also a value system. It is, it's, a, it's a lens which we, we are enculturated and socialized to see the world from. And by, by taking that in, we become isolated, we become lonely. We, our, our value as human beings are, we are dehumanized basically, without knowing it, without seeing it, because it is, it is the way we grow up. So I think, I think the, the antidote to that is to, to create experiences that create a, a deep memory in our system of woe. There is another way of living. It's like deeply ingrained in ourselves and we remember if we only have the experience a few times our system will kind of wake up and remember that, that maybe, maybe what we're told that this is the only way of moving for, forward into this idea of progress. <laughs> Instead it's like no it's happening here, it's happening in my body, I, I am in it, I'm in, in the living matrix, I'm not outside looking in and, and, and then things start to spark inside. So I think it's also a, a huge shift in, in the way we relate to ourselves in the world that, that will come out of these kinds of practices. But they need to be contextualized and they need to be understood in the, in the culture that we are part of. And, and in that we humans need to be mirrored and we need to have other people who live by example who can provide this experience. And that's why this localization movement is so extremely important at this time point especially to provide, you know, living examples of, of, of places and, and ways of being that will make our deep memory kind of, whoa, <laughs> I remember now who I am. <laughs>